Well, hey, good morning, everyone. It is so good to be here, and I'm just personally so excited for, wow, what all God is doing in this church. And hey, first, I just want to thank you, Adoration Church, and to you, Pastor Lynn, so much for allowing us to come and share what all God is doing in the ministry of Adult and Teen Challenge. Adoration Church, you guys have a special, special leader in Pastor Lynn, and I just love and respect you, and you are the real deal. So just take a moment to honor him and for the call of God of what he's done in his life. And he even went to the same Bible school as my parents, so he's got a little North Dakota roots in, in him that I'm from. So anyways, also Adoration Church, I just want to thank you for your ongoing monthly support to our program and also just for your generous support to help expand and launch our aftercare program and ladies, how many of you have maybe been blessed by the worship nights that they have here? And I know it's been an incredible blessing of what you guys do on the worship night. So thank you so much for serving and just blessing our program. And so friends, just let me tell you, Jesus still is in the business of not only changing, but transforming people's lives. And we are seeing our clients be set free from addictions by the love and the power of Jesus Christ. Our vision is this. It says this in 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Kevin Shaler, my wife. Jess and I, we are the directors of Adult and Teen Challenge, and about five years ago, we took a huge leap of faith, and we moved from North Dakota to start and open the Adult and Teen Challenge program. That's located right here in La Crosse. It's a block south of Central High School. Often, my wife and I say, we have one of the best jobs around. Every day, we get to see and experience the goodness of God at the facility soon, you are all in for a treat as you'll hear a choir and you'll hear personal testimonies from Kelly, Katie, and Grace who are free from their addictions. On November 11th of 2019, we officially opened our doors and had our first client into our program. As of today, we have admitted a total of 62 clients into our program with many more expected to come. We have never had to turn away a potential client due to their inability to pay. Thank you, Adoration Church. We simply are a long-term, faith-based, 21-bed residential drug and alcohol recovery program for women 18 and older. In 1958, the founder of Adult and Teen Challenge, David Wilkerson, was moved by an article in Life magazine about a group of gang-afflicted teenagers involved in a murder case in New York City. David began doing inner city street ministry to young addicts and gang members in New York. He saw the violence, he even had a knife held up to him by Nikki Cruz. How many of you know the story of the cross and the switchblade? He saw the drugs, he saw the alcohol, he saw the fatherlessness, he saw the prostitution, he saw the gangs, and on and on and on. David did not go to New York with the intent to start a residential treatment program. His goal was this. It was to help these young people find a better way of life that wasn't filled with violence and hatred. This soon led David in 1960 to buy a house in inner city New York where he housed at-risk adolescent youth. What started as a three-week residential treatment program was soon extended to several months and eventually grew to be a full year long program. We are part of a national and a global organization where there are over 200 locations across the United States with 1,400 locations in 125 different countries. All of this because of one man's simple obedience to saying yes to the call of God. What makes us different than most other treatment programs are these two things. First, it's the length of stay. We are designed to be a year long. We just know that the longer you are removed from the temptations of life, 
a better chance of success. And the second thing is this. It's what we call the Jesus factor. <laughs> the faith-based approach. When you encounter the love of Jesus, it changes everything. Who's been encountered by the love of Jesus here? Yeah. Our clients will often say, many treatment programs can help you get sober. But our program is not only just after sobriety, but how to stay sober long after the program ends. We also teach and disciple on how to live a life of obedience to God. In Psalms 121, 1 through 2, it asks this question. Where does my help come from? And the Bible says this, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. There are three words, and ladies, you probably have all said this, there's three words that can change everything. God, help me. They say if you want to know who God is, you study the life of Jesus. And when you study the life of Jesus, every time Jesus was moved with compassion, it was always followed by action. You see, we are a ministry of compassion where action, where we jump into the well of people's lives. Oftentimes, the clients we serve have hit the rock bottom of their well. We see individuals who come into our program who are lost, who are hopeless, who are broken, who are distraught, who are in despair, purposeless, who are misunderstood, and they're ready to give up. Church, by show of hands, how many of you know somebody who had maybe struggled with addiction in their life? As I've gone around and shared this, I don't think I haven't seen a hand that has gone up, and I just want to read a few little stats. Just last year alone, La Crosse County reported 35 drug overdose deaths. Actually, I just had a meeting this last third day and got the latest drug overdose death report, and currently this year, we we're at 20 on pace to break last year's record. Drug deaths in La Crosse County are up 344% since 2014. Also in that meeting I was at it last third day, I learned this. 50% of high school students have tried to drink, with almost 33% of those who have tried drinking before age 13. Almost 25%, a quarter of high school students have tried marijuana, with 13% of those who have tried marijuana before age 13, the latest from the county. Wisconsin ranks number three in the nation for binge drinking. In 2020, alcohol use increased by 59%. During the pandemic, heavy drinking for women rose by 41%. The odds are that in La Crosse County, one out of every 10 employees at your local business are working while using drugs. Church, maybe, just maybe the church might have the solution to this problem. Maybe, just maybe, we might be able to give those addicted a reason to hope again. Because you see, without a reason to hope, a life free from addiction cannot happen. A reason to hope, whatever your issue, whatever your struggle is, hope. You see, addiction, it takes lives. It harms relationship and addiction. It steals hope. You either die addicted or you find freedom. But somehow, during this rock bottom experience, our clients muster up a small seed of, small seed of faith. And they say, God help me. And somehow, they find our program. And I believe with everything within me, that Adult and Teen Challenge is helping transform lives. And ladies, you can make your way on up. And you'll see that here shortly. In closing, I just want to mention this. In Romans chapter 2, it talks about this. It said that the Bible, in Romans chapter 2, the Bible said that the kindness and the goodness, the kindness and the goodness of God leads us to repentance or the act of turning away from our wicked ways and turning towards him. 
Every day we are seeing our clients experience the goodness of God and as their view of him changes for the better, we are seeing their lives not just being changed, but I believe radically transformed. The impact of just one of these ladies, now think collectively of these ladies breaking free from the bondage of addiction is astronomical. We truly believe that putting hope within reach together, we can end a cycle of vic- end the vicious cycle of addiction. And this hope that we talked about, and I said it in a promo video, it had the name, and it is the name of Jesus. So Adoration Church, I just want to thank you. Here's our choir, and Josh, thank you so much for just leading these ladies. And so we're just going to go into time of choir and testimonies and praise and worship, and thank you so much for having us here today. Yeah. Come on. Ladies, why don't you praise the Lord right about now, all right? Just give him some thanks. Give him some praise. Give him some glory. Thank him. Thank him. Yeah. Hallelujah. All right, now here's the deal. So we're going to do some songs. And you might not want to sit down. But you do whatever you want to do, all right? So we're going to go like this. Ladies, sing hallelujah, mm. hallelujah, glory and salvation, hallelujah, righteous and true are all your ways, hallelujah, honor and power, oh, hallelujah, God is great and great leads you to get that going, well, hallelujah, honor and power, hallelujah, oh, and righteous and true are
Amen. Let's do this. I raise a hallelujah in the presence. In the presence of my enemy. Yeah, you got it. I raise. I raise a hallelujah. Louder than. Louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah.
hallelujah in the room. Hallelujah. Praise him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Why don't y'all take a seat just for a minute. Our friend Kelly is going to share a little story here. Hello everyone, my name is Kelly. I am 28 years old. I am from Hillsboro, North Dakota. I am eight months into my program and I am new to sharing my story. I'm a bit nervous, so bear with me. I grew up in a very dysfunctional family. My parents were never married and rarely together. I grew up without my dad in the home. My parents were both alcoholics which created a lot of chaos and instability. My parents no longer drink, but their alcohol addiction was traded for being workaholics. My dad is remarried to my stepmom, Karen, and everyone still lives in North Dakota. I grew up going to various Lutheran churches with my family. There is hardly a, day, a, hardly a weekend that I don't remember being in church. I had a decent understanding of who Jesus was, but didn't know much beyond that. Between the ages of five and nine, I was repeatedly raped and sexually abused by a couple babysitters. I have a hard time recalling the events, but the abuse was exposed through various things I would say and the fear of being around those individuals. My family got me in to see several counselors to help with the trauma I had endured. Despite the brokenness and pain I endured as a child, I never smoked or drank in high school. I played sports and successfully graduated. However, at the age of 19, I was again raped, this time by an acquaintance. I am not sure I ever really dealt with that because shortly after that, I started drinking and smoking marijuana. I became pregnant by a man who wanted nothing to do with me or the baby. In 2014, I gave birth to my son and started my journey as a single mother. When my son Hunter was six months old, I met Sean, who would eventually become my husband. He was originally from Wisconsin, but had been living in North Dakota for some time. He became the only father my son ever knew and we ended up getting married in April of 2015. Our little family of three relocated to Campbellsport, Wisconsin. Our marriage was good at first, but over time we just coexisted. There wasn't a lot of love in the home, so we started to drift apart. We ended up separating and seeing other people and eventually got divorced. This is when I met Justin. Justin had a history of addiction and criminal behavior and was not in the best place we, when we met. He, and he was finishing up a jail sentence. The lack of pursuit in my marriage coupled with unhealthy relationships tendencies left me pregnant once again. Our daughter, Sierra, is now three years old. Justin struggled to stay sober during this time, but I ignored the warning signs, or maybe I didn't want to believe it, so I buried myself into work. In February of 2019, my two children were taken away from Justin and I. I was charged with a Class C felony of child neglect due to bruises being found on my son's bottom, behind his ears, and on his wrists. Feeling blindsided and not knowing what to do with my, my life began to spiral downward. I used methamphetamine for the first time. It became my escape from the pain and failure that was staring me in the face. I used daily. Before you knew it, I was having another baby 18 months after Sierra had been born. I knew I needed help and began pursuing treatment. I checked myself into a 30-day non-based treatment facility. Shortly after that, I went to a program for expectant mothers called the Perry Center. It was a faith-based program, and although I didn't stay there like I should have until my daughter was born, my heart was re-engaged with God during this time. Justin completed his treatment, and because my addiction to him at that time was so strong, I left the Perry Center at seven months pregnant to be with him. Of course, we immediately relapsed because that was all we knew to do together. 
After two days with a, our brand new baby girl, Macy, the social worker took her due to my drug problem. This was one of the worst days of my life. I went back to my little town in North Dakota with Justin, and my drug use consumed me. I couldn't get or stay sober. We fought hard to get our kids back, but ultimately chose to do the difficult yet brave thing for our kids. We terminated our rights, and they were put up for adoption. My family had been fostering the kids for a while at this point, and by the grace of God, chose to adopt all three of them. Although this is a painful part of my life, I am so grateful the kids are still in my life. My dad and stepmom allow me to have contact and video calls with the kids and I, as I am working hard on my recovery. And... Relationship with Jesus. Ah, there, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Last fall, October 17th, was the last day I ever touched meth. I was able to go visit my kids in Minnesota for a couple days. Justin's mom had told me about the new ATC program in La Crosse, Wisconsin. On the way back, we were able to tour the facility and meet the clients and staff. It was then I made the best decision of my life to come to this program. I came on November 11th, 2021, which was ACTWW's second year anniversary of being open. Let me tell you, this has not been easy, but it has been so worth it. I had so much deep healing that has needed to happen. The program director and staff tailor the program to our individual needs. On January 6th of this year, a couple months into my program, I surrendered it all to Jesus and gave my life to him. Then, yes. then on February 25th, I took the step of being water baptized and declared to the world that I'm never going back to that old life. Hey. This program has not only helped with reconnecting with my children, but a lot of our a lot of other family members as well. I have found that the relationship with Jesus can heal even the deepest pain and regret. One of my favorite things we do every week is go out and volunteer with our community partnerships. I am set to graduate from this program in November 2022, and will be doing the aftercare program to ease slowly back into life outside of ATCWW. One thing I am currently learning in my program is how to set healthy boundaries and use the voice God has given me. I know these skills I am learning are going to set me up for a beautiful life. In February of this year, Justin also made the brave decision to get help. He checked, into, he checked himself into the Northern Indiana Adult and Teen Challenge program and is doing well. I do not know what God has planned for my future, but I know that we are both on the right path, chasing after Jesus and getting the healing we both needed. Thank you for listening to my story today. Yeah. Woo! Come on, Kelly. All right, ladies, you ready? This is how I fight my battles This is how I fight my battles Yeah, just sing it out This is how This is how I fight my battles Ooh. This is how I fight my battles I fight my battles by trusting in the Lord Getting in the word. I fight my battles with courage. I fight my battles by relying on God. I fight my battles with kindness. I fight my battles through journaling. I fight my battles by being obedient to God. I don't. 
Georgia. Well, this is how I find my so incredibly blessed to be sharing with you how amazing and miraculous our God is and to be sharing this with you outside prison walls. I hope that my story inspires you and encourages you to never give up and also reminds you that no one is too far gone for God. So I was born in a small town in southwestern Minnesota. I come from a good family and had a fortunate upbringing. My parents raised me right. I grew up in the Lutheran church and was baptized and confirmed. I knew God was real, but never acknowledged having an actual relationship with him. At the age of 14, I was raped by an acquaintance. Following this incident, my life drastically changed. <clears throat> I became estranged from my family and sought out ways in which to cope. I began using prescription painkillers and became addicted to them rather quickly. I portrayed a facade that my life was perfectly fine and kept my pill habit a secret. After graduating high school, I found myself in an extremely debilitating relationship that lasted nearly a decade and shaped me into the person I became. I was conditioned to believe I had no worth and was only on this earth to benefit someone else. By the age of 22, I had two children and my identity revolved around being a mother to them, but moreover living in complete submission to their father. In 2011, my use of prescription painkillers was exposed when I tested positive for oxycodone. <clears throat> this resulted in both my daughter and son being put in foster care. I admitted myself into Hazelden Treatment Center in Minnesota, where I completed 90 days of inpatient treatment. Following that, I did an aftercare program for mothers and children for an additional 80 days. However, upon completion, my children and I returned home to the same craziness. I remained sober for nearly four years, but was still so miserable. In 2016, I finally got out of the relationship that had controlled my life for so long. I moved back to my parents' house, and within that time of trying to become independent and get reestablished, I witnessed a childhood friend of mine overdose and die. The following day, I tried methamphetamine and heroin for the first time. It was as if I lost complete control of my life in an instant. A few months later, I signed custody of my children over to their father. 
I began living in continuous survival mode. I found myself exhibiting some of the same behaviors that I had once endured. I wasn't going to allow anyone to mess with me. Before I knew it, I found myself in jail and then in prison serving a 28-month prison sentence. While I was locked up, I was reintroduced to the Bible. I attended Bible studies and church at least three times a week. There was this innate sense in me that there was so much more than the world I was living in. I became familiar with the word, but still lacked the relationship with Jesus in which he desires to have with us. I was released from prison in late 2019 and was ready to start over. I had a great job and continued studying to get my bachelor's degree in communications. I continued going to church and Bible study, but my heart hadn't changed, nor had I confronted any of the trauma I went through. Not long after, I found myself in a place of complacency with no support to reach out to. In the beginning of 2020, a close friend of mine overdose, or, excuse me, had died unexpectedly. Again, I relapsed. I had only been out of prison for three months. The level of destructive behavior and total disregard I had for everyone was frightening. I found myself back in jail for first degree sales and second degree possession of methamphetamine, two of the most severe drug crimes you can be charged with in the state of Minnesota. I bailed out and was back on the streets within a few weeks. A few months later, I was arrested in the state of Wisconsin for five more felony charges involving drugs and firearms. I had exhausted all my resources and the police seized every dollar I had. I wasn't going anywhere. I sat in jail for nine months, just waiting to be sent back to prison, but God showed up again during that time. He actually never left. He had been trying to reveal his love the whole time. Yeah. In March of 2021, the judge allowed me to come to Adult Teen Challenge of Western Wisconsin. In just three months, I became aware of how much God loved me and began receiving his love. I also experienced that love through the people at ATCWW. The staff display grace and genuine concern, which is a reflection of God's love for each of us. Love became my reason to change and it was stronger than any fear or potential punishment that I was facing. Last summer, I had to return to Minnesota to stay on trial for my charges that I was out on bail for. I had a jury trial and was found guilty on all charges. My faith did not falter. Instead, it increased. I leaned into God and looked to him for guidance rather than shut him out again. I cannot explain to you the all-encompassing peace I experienced and the joy I felt despite what I was facing, a very long prison sentence. I found myself looking forward to going to prison because I knew my time would be done differently. My sentencing was held a few months later and I had prepared for the worst and really the only outcome, a mandatory minimum 115 month prison sentence. I knew my parents would be at my hearing and a few of the staff from ATCWW. But when I walked up to the courtroom, everyone from ATCWW was there to support me. Deep down, I felt sad because I did not want them to witness me getting sentenced to 10 years. But I realized how much they all cared for me and loved me. What a great reminder of God's love. He leaves the 99 and chases after the one. Three of the staff members and a graduate of ATCWW spoke on my behalf about the program itself and why it works, as well as testify to the change that they had seen in me. The judge was ready to hand down his sentence. Miraculously, I was granted a downward departure and placed on probation with the 10 years over my head. Everyone was shocked, I blacked out, and my attorney was shushing everyone in the courtroom. God moved in that room that day and did the impossible. Since God performed this huge miracle, I have come to the realization of his grace and mercy, and that is what fuels me to keep going and never give up. I finally confronted all the trauma, the pain, the confusion, all the darkness and evil I participated in, and how much I hurt my children. I've been healed and God has given me clarity. I now have a relationship with my children and my parents. I also have real friendships and support. ATCWW is a year-long program, and that was necessary for me. 
It took me nearly five months to even begin opening up and trusting anybody. Our program here is tailored to our individual needs. The staff really takes their time with each client and gets to know us. They recognize recovery is different for everyone. The counseling is essential and you are set up to succeed. I recently graduated on June 10th. I now live in the aftercare wing and am, am employed as a recovery coach at ATCWW. It is such a blessing. Come on. It is such a blessing to be present and available to the women going through the program. God is using me in their lives. I've been there and can relate to them. God has ignited a passion within me to, tho to help those who are stuck in the dark places that I was once in. I get to encourage these women that there is another side and that God genuinely cares for them and loves them. Listen, if God changed my heart, he can change anyone's. And that is exactly what I'm going to share with the world. My sentencing is coming up in about a month for the state of Wisconsin. I know the potential outcome, but I also know to never doubt or discount our miraculous and all-powerful God. He is the same God that performed the huge miracle in my life last August, and he can and will do it again. What I am certain of and what God continues to speak to me is Deuteronomy 31.8. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. And also 2 Chronicles 20.17. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions. Stand firm. And see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. The Lord will be with you. This is his promise to me. I have made the best decision I could make in my life, and that is to follow Jesus. No matter what, I must continue to always do the next right thing, be obedient, and listen to the Holy Spirit. No matter what happens August 15th, I know my God will always be with me, fighting for me. Thank you. Look, this isn't a part of the, the program, but I actually, could we sing over Katie right now? Would you be cool? Katie, this is going to be super awkward, but Uncle Josh, he makes it awkward. So come out here. And I want you to come stand right in front of these speakers right here if you can. And I want us to, I want you all to stand up and we're going to sing over this situation coming up in August, okay? And the Bible says in, in, in Colossians 3.16, it says, teach and admonish one another with all wisdom with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We're supposed to sing over our brothers and sisters. So I want to, I want to sing this. I've seen you move. You move the mountains. And I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way when there was no way. And I believe I'll see you do it again. I'll see you do it. Justice and in the 
name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guinea pig. Sorry about that. We just had to go ahead and do that. Ah, yeah. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us. that's about to share right now in Jesus name amen we got one more testimony for y'all good lord you know like 
come rest on us, right? Like, holy man, I feel the whole... And then I give my testimony, and I'm just so filled. <laughs> I'm like, ah! <laughs> well, it's... explode it, baby. Let's oh, hear it. Oh, my goodness. It is such a blessing to be here. When I first came to La Crosse, we came to this church, and... And on a Friday night, and we worshiped, and it was just so moving. My spirit was just lit on fire. So I'm so grateful to be here, because this is a beautiful church. So thank you for having us. This is really nice. Uh, I, get, I still get nervous public speaking, too, so bear with me as well, please. You'll get over it. Ah. So my name is Grace. I'm, well, it says on here 44, but I just turned 45 a couple months ago. So I was born and raised in Milwaukee, and I come from several generations of substance abuse and mental illness. It has been a sore subject for both sides of my family, my mother's side and my father's side. There was a lot of pride behind the scenes. I believe that due to depression and anxiety that we endured it through our, my family, we learned how to cope. Everyone learned how to cope with drugs and alcohol. This lifestyle caused my parents to divorce when I was 12 years old. Life got real chaotic real quick. Mom had to get a job, and she was pretty bitter about that. And Dad was out of the picture for a bit because she really wanted to make his life difficult, and she knew how to do that. Uh, this had me and my brother take a really big turn away from both of my parents emotionally and mentally. Mom began to take her anger out on me physically, after a few, many beatings, my dad was granted full custody of me and my brother. In those days, I felt unlovable, unlovable, and unseen. With a short period of time, uh, when I was very young, I learned how to use alcohol and drugs as well to numb out that pain. Um, behind that, there was all kinds of other things, food and sex, and it was like addiction to everything, anything that would numb, numb me out. My friends became my family, and I fell victim for the love of money and started selling drugs to keep up with my lifestyle. Searching for love in all the wrong places, we were a mess. In unhealthy relationships, both me and my brother. This was just the beginning of decades of living as a slave to complete sin. Gang violence, parties, sex, rape, drug use, and abuse were just a part of my life, and it was just what we became accustomed to. It was the normal. My daughter was born when I was just 18. I was married at 19 and divorced by 22. I wasn't, re I wasn't ready for marriage, uh, but I did love my daughter. Shortly after that, I found myself in another relationship that I thought was love too, and we had a son together. Uh, but that relationship was very codependent as well, and and it was just very toxic. Once again, I didn't really know like what a healthy relationship was. It was something that I had to learn. And um, I struggled to make ends meet with being a single mom. It was, it was hard. But we seemed to get by. And we seemed to get by. Even though I was responsible for two children, I was really angry, mad. I never thought that my life was going to end up being so difficult. Um, you know, paycheck to paycheck, and then paycheck comes, and then you're just completely broke. You're lucky to have five bucks. Um, so, <clears throat> but God was always there. I started to realize that, you know, when I started to get a little bit older, but there was um, a part in this journey where it was really difficult. My kids were a blessing to me, and they really kept me moving. Like, they loved me through my mess. I don't, uh, they say children are very resilient. They are. They love you through everything, and it's quite amazing to me. Um, as some time passed, where am I? Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, there was some time passed. And with this, with this lifestyle, people were just dying. I mean, it was just one after another. Dozens of family members, and when I mean a dozen, I mean at least 12 people, just one after another. There was a point in time where we had few, four funerals in one year. Um, and my brother had passed away, and he was my only brother, and he also died of addiction. So most of the people that had passed away in my family within the last decade was due to drugs and alcohol, 
or, and or food, um, you know, just diabetes, heart disease, due to unhealthy lifestyle. Um, my brother was my only brother. He was a year younger than me, so we were just really close, and that's where despair took me to a completely another level. He struggled really bad with cocaine addiction. From the time he was about 14, I found out that he was dipping in, in some really hard street drugs, and, and uh, it took his life really, really early. He was 37, and he had a wife and two, two daughters that he loved dearly. So this just took our family like for a complete upside down. We, it was very unexpected, even though we knew he struggled with addiction. You know, it still was very unexpected. So I got to this place of this is, you know, and then my mom died just three years ago. And she struggled real bad with addiction, too. And it just took me to this place of, what is happening? I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to die like this? I was like, no, I'm not. I'm not doing this. And that's where I asked God to come into my life. Because I didn't want to go, you know, I was already de dead spiritually, right? Like I, and I didn't realize that that was happening in my life. Just dead. And, you know, like, I used to go to church when I was a kid. My grandma used to make my dad take us to church. And there was, it was a little Presbyterian church on the south side of Milwaukee with all these Scottish people. And, and I just remember being so, like, I remember it being so peaceful there when I was a kid. It was just so, it was like the most peaceful place while I was growing up was there in that church. So then when I started to get older, I was like, something's missing out of my life. Something's missing. And I started to realize that it was definitely my soul was broken, my spirit was broken, and I needed something to fill that hole, and I didn't know what it was. And then I realized that the Holy Spirit in the church was where the peace was at. And I was like, oh. it was just this huge moment for me. So eight years ago, I, re I realized that I needed God in my life. That's what I was missing Jesus. And, um, and it just, it w it's been a, a, a really ex experience for me since then. Like being a, becoming a Christian woman from the life that I have came from mm -hmm. has been a huge transition for me that I just longed for it so badly. I wanted it so badly because Jesus is the only thing that helps me stay sober. I, I have been able to quit cigarette smoking cigarettes too. I, it's just unbelievable. Nothing short of a miracle from coming from my life. Amen. And so I don't have the urge to just go running anymore. And I praise the Lord for that. I just feel like uh, I just always wanted to run. I think we just want to run. We live in this world where we just want to go and get away from everything for just a minute. Because it's a little, but we have to run to Jesus. Yes. We cannot run to a bottle of booze or a man or a woman or you know, like drugs, or it just doesn't fill you, right? It's just that hole that doesn't, it just doesn't fill you. God is healing me today in a way that I never thought was, would be possible. I never thought I would be able to be able to stand in a church, tell my story um, without being afraid. You know, the fear was like really consumed me when, when God first started really working in my life. Like I was fearful of like, and the Lord was just like, look, you're going to have to leave everybody behind. Everybody. The only people you have to worry about is your two children, and you leave everything behind. And so that's exactly what I've done. And I have wonderful people in my life today, absolutely wonderful people. And I have to just pray for my family and friends that just haven't made it to that place yet. And God is working in my children crazy, you know, because my life is changing. So... You know, and then there was a part in, in, this, in this journey that really hit my heart because my children are young adults now, and they both struggle with addiction. And that was my worst fear, was that they would have to struggle with this because it is suffering. It's suffering. And so God's got me right where he needs me to be. I'm inside of his will today, and that's all that matters to me right now because I want... You know, even if something were to happen to me, 
I'm going out, God's going to take me to heaven, and I'm going to be sober. And that was the most important thing to me. And so this program has gotten me to this place where I am safe from, you know, I have this safe environment. So I graduated last month with Katie, and we live in the aftercare program. It is just the most beautiful space, and it is such a blessing to this community. They have it in Milwaukee, too. They have, like, like Kevin said, it's there. We're all over the place. I mean, it's you have to get to a place of this spirit of surrender. That's I think the hardest part is just saying, "Hey, Lord, just have my life fully. Just have my life fully. You be the lead, you be the follower. Let me follow you. Whatever you say goes." You know, I woke up on the wrong side of bed this morning, and I was just like, and the Lord's like, "Stop it. <laughs> That's enough." And I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> so I just, today I have, I have, I'm still, he, I'm going to, you know, I think I'm going to be in this place of healing probably till the Lord takes me home. You know, I think, I don't think you ever, you know, he wants us to need him. When we have that relationship with him, it's just, you know, it's just, it's just that, hey, look, you need me. You cannot do this without me. You know, oh. see, I always need a nap after this, <laughs> but, uh, Kevin, when I first got into, um, Matthew 11, 28, 30, love my brother, Kevin. I love you, Kevin. And, um, you know, come to me all who are weary and heavy burden, and I will give you rest, refreshing for your souls, salvation, salvation. Oh, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest. The Lord's teaching me how to be humble. Because that's something that I've struggled with for a long time. Or my yoke is easy to bear, and my burden is light. God is teaching us here what to do, and he gives us strength and wisdom to be successful. Lord, thank you for the wisdom that you give me today. Um, thank you for having us. This is so great. I get really, I don't know, I get super nervous, but I, afterwards I feel so good. I'm like, it's like a release that happens. And it's truth, right? All truth. I mean, when it, when it comes to like serious trauma and stuff that happens, like you need good community and good friends. You can't do it without that. <laughs> so thank you for this community in lacrosse. I love it here. I probably will be here for a while. So, thank you. <laughs> Come on. That was amazing, Grace. Why don't you guys stand up? Let's sing Amazing Grace together, can we?
ladies, ladies. I don't know how to end. <laughs> Great job. and Praise God. The recipe, I believe, how we overcome, it says in Revelation, that we overcome by Jesus and our stories, our testimony. And I believe Satan just took a little. Come on. <laughs> and so thank you, ladies. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Pastor Lynn. Can we invite your wife to come up as well? How many of you are so blessed today by the ministry? Just one more time, let's honor them. Thank you guys for your ministry to us today. We're going to pray for them if we can, if I can make it through. Father, I thank you for this ministry. <laughs> you came to set the captive free. And all of us were captives. But you came into our prison cell, broke the chains, and brought us out. Your grace is still amazing to our lives. No matter how long we have known you, we will not forget what you have done for us, God. Father, I thank you for this ministry. May you continue to cause the light of your favor to be poured forth upon it, God. May you give them renewed strength May God, you anoint them with fresh oil. May they be empowered by your spirit. May the team, God, that you're raising up and setting in place, God, may all the pieces of the puzzle come together. And Father God, we thank you for those that are coming, those that are on the way. And Father, we pray that they encounter you May the revelation and the glory of Jesus continue to shine through this place. Father, I thank you that you are Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides, that you go ahead and make the provision. Father, we thank you that this ministry is not done expanding. Lord, we just thank you that you're going to lengthen their cords. You're going to broaden the, the tabernacle of their tent. God, that this is but a beginning of what you're going to do. We thank you for your unfolding plan for them. Lord, we thank you for doing it in our city and in our region. God, I thank you for the day when addiction will end in this region. Father, we want to believe you for the complete extinction of addiction to drugs and alcohol in our region. We thank you again. We make these declarations. We thank you that the Cooley region is in store for a move of God's Spirit, a revival that will so fundamentally change the very foundations of this region. God, I thank you, God, that you're going to sweep in hundreds, thousands those that have never even known you, but God, you have their name. You've appointed them and ordained them to receive eternal life. Lord, I thank you for that day. I thank you for causing boats to be filled with fishes, a net-breaking harvest where every church will be full, that we'll have a problem of seeding everyone, God, as you break in. Lord God, throughout the region, I just thank you, God, that churches will be filled with those that will be seeking and crying out for you. Lord, I thank you that Teen Challenge is going to be one of those parts of the net that brings them in. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. We bless them today in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to be seated just for maybe three more minutes. 
we want to bless this ministry. We support the monthly, and we we have given special gift in the the launch of their extended facility, opening up that new wing. But we also want to continue to sow, and so. Uh, if those that are going to help with the ushering of the baskets, if you can come, Lord, we just want to bless this ministry, encourage them with this offering. And if you don't have uh, an ability, because many of us don't carry cash or checks, uh, if you're writing a check, make it out to adoration, but specify uh, Teen Challenge. We'll make sure that everything gets to them. But if you want to give online, you can go to adoration and give through the adoration app. Or you can go to the website, adorationchurch.com, or you can go to Church Center and look up Adoration, and you can give through that. Uh, But bless them as they're with us today. Let's sow back into this ministry. Father, we thank you again for your people and their heart to give and to bless this ministry. Bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you feel like you've been to church today? Wow. I feel like I've been to church. Or as we say it in the South, church. I've been to church today. Jesus is wonderful. All right, let's stand one more time. And if you could stand and raise up your hands, we're going to release you with the blessing. Adoration Church, the family of Jesus, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord be great. May he lift up the, the light of his countenance and shine upon you. May the Lord be merciful to you, and may he give you his peace, his shalom, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Bless you guys. Thank you for coming today. Have a great week.